Hello everybody and welcome to the Alien vs Predator Galaxy podcast. This is regular host Aaron Percival. And this is co-host Adam Zeller. And we are back for episode 106, which is our 2020 Alien Day special episode. So like last year, I wanted to get somebody special on the show. Um, somebody who has you know a very large imprint on the series. Uh, last year we spoke to Carrie Henn, um, who's played Newt, obviously, if uh, you guys don't recognise names. And this year we went a little different. We went into the sort of creative side, the writing side. And we were lucky enough to secure who we could consider the original Alien 3, Alien 4 and Alien 5 writer. I'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Mark Verhaden to the show. Hello. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, today, Mark. It's very much appreciated. Um, and before we start geeking out about aliens, though, could you just tell us a little about Mark Verhaden outside of aliens? You know, in, in your own words, who are you? What do you do? And do you have any sort of specific big interests outside of uh, Alien and Predator? Well, OK, um, so I grew up uh, loving comics and loving science fiction and movies and um, horror. And I always wanted to make that a career somehow. So um, uh, I moved to Los Angeles in like 1983 to try to break into uh, those fields. Um, I grew up in Portland, Oregon, which as soon as I left Portland, Oregon, a company called Dark Horse Comics started in Portland, Oregon. Of course, waited till I left. And um, I started my writing career actually writing for Dark Horse. Um, and, um, and that's how Aliens came about. But uh, I wrote about 100, 120 comics for DC, for Marvel, for, for um, Dark Horse over the years. But my main job has been working in television and film for the last 30 years. And so I've worked on all sorts of shows um, as a writer, as a producer, and now as a showrunner. Um, from Battlestar Galactica to Smallville to Heroes, uh, most recently on Daredevil and um, um, Ash vs. Evil Dead, and then Swamp Thing, which came out uh, last year. Um, so those are all shows I've worked on. There's a bunch of others, but those are the main ones. So my interest is film and, and comics and all that stuff and writing. Um, and... Um, my, do I have other interests? They've kind of all gone away as time has gone on. I used to like shopping for books. Bookstores have all gone broke. Um, I used to like uh, shopping for music. Now it's all online. So it's it's funny uh, how things have uh, kind of constricted with the Internet, but the Internet's fantastic. Um, anyway, so that's that's what I've been doing. And a tradition on our podcast, especially with guests such as yourself, who actually get to shape and influence the franchises that we love so much, is to ask them about the first time they ever experienced the series. You know, do you remember the first time you ever came across our favorite acid-blooded alien? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I remember seeing the uh, first film, the Ridley Scott film, when it came out. And it was at like 79, I think, um, yeah. 80. Yeah. And uh, really liked it. And, but I really remember seeing aliens. Um, I remember going first day, I think in the, even in the afternoon, the first screening um, at a theater in Pasadena, California, which is now closed. So I really do remember the day and being totally blown away by it. And I loved it. Saw it several more times. Um, so I remember that. Um, and then um, I also remember seeing Aliens 3, which was, was not quite as exciting for reasons I'm sure we'll get into. Of and uh, so that was my first, my first uh, introduction. I mean, I, I like I liked Alien a lot, but I really loved Aliens. I thought that one really knocked it out of the park. Great, great movie. Would you say that's your favorite of the entire series, then? Oh yeah, Aliens. Yeah, um, it just had everything. It was a great action movie. It, was, it had a lot of heart. Um, it had great creature designs, and you know, obviously they were from the first film, but. Um, but I really liked the heart in it, that, that part, uh, really, you know, you felt for those characters, you wanted them to succeed. And, you know, the scene with Ripley with the alien queen at the end was just fantastic. Um, still great. Uh, no great movie. there. See it yeah. a couple of years ago. It's still great. So. How did you catch it on the re-releases? Um, of the, you mean in the theater? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've seen it like 
so many times now I can't remember <laughs> when I was doing the comics. Obviously, I was watching it over and over again because that was my my Bible, essentially. So uh, to see what the characters look like, to figure out what that um, the pilot alien was, um, which I kind of got wrong. Um, and uh, uh, and just to, to really sort of absorb the gestalt of those characters uh, to understand them, Hicks, especially and Newt. So um, I had it on Laserdisc, I remember, back in the 80s oh, and nice. watched that over and over again. So, <laughs> wow. Yeah, I still have yet to see Aliens in theaters. I'm hoping one of these days. I've seen the first film a few times in theatrical re-releases, but I've never been able to find uh, here in Salt Lake City uh, a re-release of the second one. Mm. Oh, I've I've... I'd actually got tickets. Well, no, I was going to get tickets to go and see an- another showing it would have been this month, actually, um, over here. But with the, you know, the chaos that is the world right now, that all got cancelled. Right. But no, I'll, I will never miss an opportunity to see these films on uh, on the big screen. Yeah, it's been fun. I think I've seen almost all of them on the big screen. Um, so um, some of the later ones just once, um, but. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I've seen all of them. I may not have seen the second Aliens vs. Predator, now that I think about it. I may have missed that one. Oh, I, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure Adam... Uh, yeah, uh, um, most fans are, are uh, not big on the second AVP, but I actually am one of its rare defenders, I think. There's there's some stuff the, the to The three like of you it. that exist yeah. in the world. <laughs> oh, but that kind of... Yeah, no, it's uh, well. I, I'm the only one who would say it's worth watching, but <laughs> <laughs> at least at least come to your own conclusion about it. But that kind of leads into our next question, which is um, beyond just Alien Three. What was your? Um, have you really followed the Alien films after your involvement with the comics ended? Like, what did you think of? I guess both franchises that that you would seen more specifically. Um, well, obviously, I saw Alien 3, which um, at, at the time was a bit of a shock, not just because it, it negated what my comics had done, which is very selfish, but because it was just so bleak. And um, to, I hope people don't mind spoilers on this. They probably I know. See, uh, oh. <laughs> uh, you know, the fact that, that Newt and Hicks are just killed in the, in the uh, credits was just such a backhanded way to deal with those characters. Now, in hindsight, actually thinking about it a long time, I kind of admire the the creative courage behind that, and I I sort of get why you'd want to just sort of clear the decks and do your do your film. So I, I kind of admire Fincher on that level, um, but I still thought emotionally it was a really it just you know all the excitement and and the caring that went into Aliens between Ripley and Newt just kind of went whoosh, out the window. Um, so my opinion of that one's always been sort of colored by that first experience. But I've come to admire it more for its craft and, and what it was trying to do. Um, Alien Resurrection, I've seen probably just once. Uh, you know, it was it was fine. Um, I, uh, after that, I think is AVP, right? Mm-hmm. Um, which was fun because I my name was in it. Why I'm not sure. I didn't write any of the Aliens versus Predator books, but that's okay. Um, it's fun to hear your character scream, "Help! Help!" and somebody's going, "Bear Hayden! Bear Hayden!" You know, that was kind of cool. Um, second AVP, I don't even remember. And then the Prometheus movies, or movie, um, it just was odd to me. <laughs> and, uh, so it doesn't do me any good to say anything good or bad about them. A friend of mine actually worked on, on uh, I think, the second. I'm trying to, there was Prometheus. What was after Prometheus? Alien yeah. Covenant. Yeah. A friend of mine worked on Alien Covenant. And, you know, I think they're trying to do interesting things, but it just Covenant felt like aliens sort of again Um, to me. I've only seen it once. So if it sounds like I haven't followed it too closely (laughs) since the beginning, it's true. I, I, you know, I see them and I'm interested in them. I haven't followed them religiously. Not out of any malice, just, you know, I'm doing other things. Just adult life and time and availability. Yeah, Yeah, that's that's fair. Could you tell our listeners how you came to be involved with the Alien series initially? Was it just through your existing relationship with Dark Horse because of the American? I th- well, I think that had a, played a part in it. Um, I was friends with the guys at Dark Horse, the guys who started Dark Horse, Mike Richardson, 
who's the publisher, and Randy Stradley, who's been their editor. They're all st who are obviously still in those positions there now, 35 years later. Um, I was friends with them before I left for Los Angeles, and um, I did the American for them, and I, I still remember the day, actually. I got a call from Mike saying that they thought they were getting the rights to do Aliens comics, and I just put my hand up. I said, uh, well, I'm the guy that needs to write that. <laughs> and luckily they agreed. So um, that was as simple as that. I mean, sometimes it's just like being there and saying, yes, I want to. <laughs> and uh, I was lucky enough to be there. And of course, a huge fan of the first two movies. So that it wasn't a hard sell <laughs> to get me to want to do it. And um, so that's how it started. So take us back to before you actually began working on the series in, in, you know, in proper earnest. I mean, what were those early conversations like following that? I'll do it, please. You know, was, right. was there like a natural direction that you had in your head that you just went to straight away? Or did the series involve a lot of um, a lot of story spinning to figure out where you were going to go with it? I think there was uh, the initial discussions were that we knew we couldn't use Ripley um, for various rights reasons. So, um, so not, not a, long... a story, not a story or sequel concerns. It was purely oh, right. no, it was just, just rights. We could not use the Ripley character um, for reasons that a little bit beyond me. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I understand there's likeness issues you get with actors who do not want to be portrayed in books and things like that. So, um, so we couldn't use her. And I think there may have been likeness issues, frankly, with everyone. There would have been issues. So the natural thing to think about was how do we use some of the characters and um, but not worry about their likenesses? Well, if Newt's 18, then we don't have to worry about that. And if Hicks is scarred to the point where he's almost unrecognizable, we didn't have to worry about that. So those are very you know, sort of I loved using those characters, but those were sort of the uh, pragmatic reasons why they are who they are in the story. But I also just wanted to jump ahead. And, and I do remember a lot of conversations that we really wanted to bring it back to Earth and we really wanted to see the aliens on Earth. And um, so uh, then it became what are the, what happens once we get them and bring them back and um, and the situation with uh, the religious cult and the military and bionational and all that. Some of that sprang from just extrapolating on what was in Aliens, the movie. But, um, you know, some of it was sort of unique to what we were trying to do. And that was me just sitting, thinking about what would be fun to sort of extrapolate on, you know, a, a world where a, a cult would gather around this creature that was so much superior to, to man, at least to their minds, and um, came to revere it and, and want to commune with it somehow and sort of this doomsday cult, which have existed all through humanity, unfortunately. So um, it, so I remember writing several, or at least, you know, outlines for, for breaking down the books and the series. And I also say that it was colored by uh, knowing Mark Nelson was going to draw it. Um, once I saw his art, then I knew that I wanted to take this in a more darker, horrific direction. Um, sort of a cross between the tone of Aliens and Alien, the first one. Um, that the, this would, his moody art definitely lent itself toward grisly, um, but also unsettling moments. He also drew a great alien, so the, the more we did of that, the better. So it was, um, you know, um, kind of applying the things I had learned from working in film a little bit back then. I hadn't done much to this format which I love, comics, and finding a way to do those stories and making them dynamic and action-packed and interesting and compelling and really dig into the characters of Newt and Hicks and Butler to some extent. So, And you... Oh, sorry, go ahead, Aaron. No, I was going to say, I mean, you, you, you say about um, things you'd learned from the film and stuff. You know, something you can say about the first series is, you know, it does feel so cinematic and the scope as well is huge. I mean, you do so much in those six issues compared to, I think, pretty much every single series that's come since. I mean, everything you managed to put in this was just... It still it still blows me away that there's so much in there and, it, and it's so coherent for it. it you did... 
He did a fantastic job on that first series. Jeez, thanks. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> um, yeah, look, it, I got to say, there was a little bit of we didn't know when we started if we'd be doing more of these. So it was like, just put it in there. Mm. And um, I still remember, um, this almost never happens, by the way, but I would get to the end of a story I was writing, one of the issues, and I'd go like, man, I could really use two more pages, you know. And I'd call up Dark Horse, and there'd be a little hemming and hawing because it's expense, right, uh, everything. But they'd agree. And uh, so a couple books, I think, went to 26 pages or a little bit more of the original issues. doesn't matter when you see the final thing together. But um, it's just so much we, I wanted to get in there, but yet also give Mark Nelson the room to do his amazing graphics. I didn't want to clutter it up so much you couldn't do his work. So it was finding that balance between uh, a fairly dense story, but also giving Mark room to do those great aliens action moments and uh, the very dark moments, uh, you know, of Jesus, all sorts of stuff and torture and <laughs> uh, aliens and taking out people's heads and all that. No, no punches stuff. pulled. No punches pulled. Okay. And you, you mentioned the corporation Bionational, and this was a new company you introduced um, and featured it rather than using Whaling Utoni from the, the first two films. Was this a stipulation from Fox? Unfortunately, that's one I don't remember. So okay. it, it may have been, um, or it may have been just the thought that, you know, having jumped forward 16 years or however many years we had, 15 years, I guess, that it felt like, um, let's do a new company. But I, I actually don't recall. It may have been a rights issue too. I, I don't remember. Yeah. I, th I think it's been um, creatively motivated with a number of people who have worked on the franchises through the years, like with Seeks Incorporation, which was introduced in Alien Isolation. And then in the original AVP comics, you had the Chingusa. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's I, I do kind of like seeing these rival corporations pop pop up. It keeps it a bit more interesting. Well, it's, yeah. good, it's good world building as well. You know, it, it it's like how we have problems with um, Fox well, I suppose studios mentality over the last couple of years of just, you know, going back to Ripley, you know, there's more to it than, than her and there's more to it than just Wayland. So, you know, having like those, those new corporations, you know, it, it's, it gives you a bit of creative freedom as well. I think so. It's just, you know, opening it up and, and, you know, it felt like also, I mean, and, and I, again, don't recall exactly what was going on at the time, but there'd be a competitive, um, you know, scramble to get your hands on this creature, um, on the technology of it. So, you know, I don't know that it would just be one company always wanting it. And, and I, I haven't followed all the Aliens comics that have come out, but, you know, it does seem like there'd be corporate wars over trying to get your hands on the technology of and the biology of these creatures, which was pretty awesome. So, um, again, it's really just it was, a lot of what came in those stories was just trying to extrapolate today and then seeing where we might be going. And um, it's a little creepy at times because I was rereading it this morning and I'd forgotten the reference to the World Trade Center yeah. uh, being taken out, which was, oh, okay. That's one unfortunate. I wish I hadn't been prescient about that. I wasn't, of course. I just threw it in there. <laughs> it's just an aside. But um, that was, I don't know, that's interesting. So you, you actually mentioned um, knowing about Mark being on as the artist. And um, that was something I was wondering about in terms of one particular story element you went with. Um, so beside, despite being clued in by the original Alien and having since become something of a staple, you know, there's a big twist in, in book one with the synthetic Marine team. And that, that really surprised me the first time I read the story. Uh, now, did Nelson's black and white style influence you in that decision in being able to keep the color of the blood a secret? Um, you know, I, again, it's one that I'm not wholly remembering. So in, in terms of the blood color, um, I think uh, we may have talked about the idea that in 15 years they'd fix that that the androids that have created since then. But I think in the books, when we see them colorized, there's still a strange color of blood. So um, I don't recall that, which may have been my mistake, that 
that I just sort of went over the fact that they would have had different colored blood. Um, but it does seem like if you were going to build an android to look exactly like a human, um, you would tr probably try to fix as much of it to look that way as possible. Um, I, I, that's a really terrible answer to that question. <laughs> I actually just, I, I don't, don't recall if we'd even thought about that. Um, okay. I did know that, of course, it was going to be in black and white because that's just how um, the book, that's what Dark Horse was at right then. Um, I don't think they were doing many color books back then at all. And um, again, that colored more sort of the tone as opposed to story decisions. Fair enough. It was always something that that bugged me when they colored it for the re-releases because they killed two of the crew before the big reveal and they'd colored it red. Um, mm -hmm. But then when, when Butler gets um, eviscerated, you know, they've gone with this, the standard white. Um, so that always bugged me in the color bit. You know, it's not there in the black and white. So that was always something I'd, I'd wondered about. But fair enough. Um, I'll just say in my head, the definitive version is the original black and white. So they've colorized it. They've changed the names. They've done all sorts of things to it editorially. I don't have a problem with that. That's fine. Um, but they're not my preferred editions. So my preferred editions are the ones that came out in the large hardcovers um, a couple of years ago. So that's the original names. The ones that aren't colored should stay uncolored and um, keep the original coloring for the others. Mm. I'm, I'm so glad that they released those anniversary hardcovers. Um, they made them, I mean, they sold out really fast, uh, at least over in, yeah. in my particular corner of the pond. Um, but no, those are gorgeous. I've, the ones I always uh, read now, these editions, and even just the, the blinking paper that they used as well, you know, with the with the black yeah. pages yeah. And, and the blue pages in the um, in the second volume. I remember Gorgeous. Randy, the the editor of that, calling me one day to say they decided to put silver down the um, uh, pages on the on the outside, and I thought, wow, that's cool. Um, it's, it's, it was, it's, it's, you know, it was meant to be the definitive edition of these. Um, and, um, so I was really happy to see those come out. Yeah. Especially since I don't think they've been collected again, origin, uh, you know, in, in the, your original version up until that point for a goddamn long while, you know, 20 years or something. Yeah, at least. Yeah. Um, so one, one of the elements that book one introduced that I absolutely love but I don't feel gets played enough with now is the idea of religion surrounding the aliens. Um, it comes up every now and again, but it's nowhere near as prominent as like a lot of the um, other sort of things that you introduced in Alien that would become quite staples or, um, you know, uh, frequently revisited um, story tropes. But, the idea of religion surrounding Alien was just one that's always fascinated me and one I wish they would play with more. So could you tell us a little about the concept of the Church of Immaculate In mm -hmm. love of my life. Tell us where the um, concept of the Church of Immaculate Incubation came from. Um, I think it, it came from um, a just general distrust of um, organized anything. But um, back in the 80s, I mean, there was there was an explosion of, of various religious cults. Um, I grew up in Oregon and there was a uh, cult that took over a small town um, and uh, out in rural Oregon. that was kind of big news um, back in the early 80s um, and um, Scientology and, uh, you know, Jonestown, things like that. Scientology so, been around since the 80s. I think it's been around uh, since longer than that. Wow. I didn't, I didn't realize it was that old. Yeah. Um, I was in college, and this was a long time ago. I still remember walking down the street and being stopped by people who wanted to get me to join Scientology. That's 40 years ago. So um, they've been around a long time. So just, just the idea that there are – by the way, I'm not anti-religion. I'm just anti sort of how religion can be used improperly. And um, so the idea of people obsessing with a creature that they considered more um, considered superior to humanity 
for very perverse reasons, just struck me as an interesting place to go. And so those characters being obsessed with the aliens and wanting to commune with them in a very sick way um, was just something that appealed to me. Um, I can't I can't give it any more sort of reason for doing it except coming out of my own distrust of of following blindly following leaders who take you down paths that you should not be going down, which is true of the second book with Spears, um, the general. I mean, I, I, you know, again, organized stuff in general. I always like keep your eyes open, and so a lot of a lot of the work I've done, and later like in Battlestar Galactica, you know, for whatever reason has elements of don't trust everything you hear um, because it may not be true. Not in a paranoid way, just in a just watch yourself. Think about way. it. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And of course, the church is the one that ultimately screws the world over in the end. You know, it's their assault on Bionational that lets the alien get out everywhere. So uh, they are. I guess really the true bad guys of, of your trilogy, really. Um, funny how that works out. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a really interesting theme, and I thought the way you handled it in the comic was was really well. It's something we hadn't really seen up until that point, even though that was a bit before I was really into the comics. Was the whole, I guess, um, religious cult activity around biological horror, and we've seen it done pretty well in some other franchises too, like. Stuff like Dead Space or um, uh, what was another one that was? Does Mass Effect do it? I can't remember if Mass Effect does it or not, but but Dead Space was a big one. I guess Resident Evil Four, as far as the games, that's kind of based uh, around a religious cult. But but it's a cool thing for the Alien franchise, and and I would like to see it kind of return more in the future. I know Prometheus kind of tackled some religious themes, but it was it was done in a different way, more focused on personal belief rather than mm -hmm. you know cult mentality so uh, but again i thought i thought the way you did it was was really well done no well, thank you it was um, you know again I, I have to go back all fun to write this was uh -huh. um i should i should just I'll interpose here that one of the great things about working on this series all three of them was that fox was virtually hands off of what we were doing um, I don't remember more than, and Dark Horse may have gotten more notes, which they then protected me from, but I don't recall getting more than two or three notes from them through the entire series. And um, basically, they just loved it. So, by the way, that's so unusual. Mm, <laughs> you know, I mean, cause... anyone works on licensed books now, it's um, that is an incredibly unusual situation on a major property from a from a big studio, but um, we had someone there uh, who was just in love with what we were doing, seemed to be, and um, I remember one note I got was, I think there's a pregnant woman in one of the, one of the I think it's in the first one, and it, the note was, be careful how you portray her, <laughs> something like that, and I said, okay, <laughs> um, if that's your note, taken, but uh, it just was such a great creative experience. And, and Dark Horse, you know, basically I wrote them. Uh, Mark drew them. Uh, Denny Bouvet drew them. Sam Keith drew them. They printed them. That was it. Um, there wasn't a lot of drama involved in, in getting these uh, produced. Um, again, incredibly rare. Um, mm -hmm. I look back on those days. I didn't know how good I had it. So, Especially considering just how significant you know what you were doing was to this you know the the story of the whole the whole alien series i mean you fucked earth over man <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> that's got implications and yeah that they just let you do what you wanted was still it still surprises me i mean i wonder if that's just a difference in how you know studio sort of treated their cinematic um you know franchises back then in terms of the expanded media compared to now where it's all like a um you know a multimedia um kind of thing i mean because the last six years or so i think i mean i know fox were very hand on, hands on with the comics and and the um the novels um sounds like a completely different experience to to, to yours at the yeah. same time, I've been pretty surprised lately, especially with the whole Disney deal going on, that the comics have continued to come out really consistently. Uh, consistently, and we've had a, 
a variety of different kinds of stories. They haven't all been, because that's what I was worried about a little bit back in Fire and Stone and uh, <clears throat> Life and Death is that everything would just be this interconnected, interwoven thing. But recently we've had a, a number of, of standalone stories that have been really uh, creatively awesome in my opinion. So I'm, I'm glad Dark Horse is still on their game. And as far as uh, screwing the earth over, uh, it was cool to see. I know you said, um, Mark, you haven't really kept up with the Aliens comics too much, but eventually in the Three World War arc, Earth is kind of reclaimed, like it follows your stories, and mm. then life eventually gets back to normal on, on Earth. So that was kind of a, a cool thing to see. One of the fun things about writing the first ones is I didn't have to read all the old ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but... Uh, uh, I haven't kept up as well as I should. In fact, after we're done with this, maybe you can email me a, a list of what your favorite um, Aliens uh, graphic novels are. Obviously, I'm in touch with Dark Horse all the time, but I just uh, I haven't kept up uh, as much much as I should. They've done a lot of them, um, which is great, and I'm glad they keep doing them. Um, but uh, I was going to go back and just say, I think one thing about when I started this was, this is sort of one of your questions, I think later it was about, how you know movie comics were originally not tie-ins were not seen as being particularly a valid you know great way to do comics um there'd been a few good ones but there'd been a lot of not great ones and they're sort of seen as souvenirs um almost of the movies and so i don't know if that was fox's thing going into this was sort of like well this will just be something the fans can get as sort of a add on you know to their experience of aliens and if it's if it's okay we're fine with that whatever um i think even they might have been a little surprised by how successful the books were um i know we were uh, so um but uh yeah now nowadays um they take these franchises incredibly seriously and um they have to open them up to something otherwise you got to do new stories or the books won't sell but um got to keep us busy between films after yeah. all do something and you mentioned um Ripley before she wouldn't make her comic debut until the third series, like you said, due to restrictions placed on you by Fox. But the first series did include a reference to her where Colonel Stevens character says, you know what happened to Rip Ripley. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts at the time about where she had disappeared off to. I think I told this to Aaron in a, in an email or an instant message that uh, at the time I was asked that as the books one and two were coming out. And um, before I knew we could use Ripley, my answer was not my problem. Um, <laughs> just the user. So to me, just expand any sort of expand any headspace on what had happened to her was a waste of time because I didn't know. All I knew is I couldn't use her. So only in how it impacted the characters and that she abandoned Newt, obviously, when Newt was very young and it abandoned Hicks only in that sense. But in terms of where she went. When we did one and two, up and I, my memory is up until toward the end of working on the second series, was when they opened up and said we could use Ripley. So that was a surprise. Um, and um, so up until that point, I didn't think we'd ever have her. And um, so there wasn't any reason to really think it through. Um, the third book ended up dealing with that to some extent, but I hadn't really thought about it too much as I was writing one and two. And on the same vein, Bishop never once made an appearance in any of your series, and I don't think he was referenced either. Uh, why no Bishop? That may have been a rights thing, too, that we couldn't mm -hmm. use Lance Hendrickson. I, I'm just, uh, again, it's foggy. It's been 30 years, but um, I think it may have been a rights issue. Also, uh, well, th I'm going to say that. I, th I may have tried to use him and was told we couldn't, because I remember writing him into something. And then maybe we just couldn't use him for some reason. Okay, but well, you, you did um, you did just mention this, um, you know, in regards to the perception of tie-ins being a, a low form of comics, and then your aliens is the absolute smash that it was. Um, at what point did it become obvious to Dark Horse and and you in terms of your involvement that you know this this was gold? and you had to keep making Aliens, you know, when did you know that you had to begin working on a book two? Well, it's funny, you know, I kept pretty good records, still do. So I went back to see when I started working on the second Aliens book, 
And I turned in the first issue script for that before I'd written the scripts to the end of the first series. Wow. So it was pretty early on. Um, I think the book started coming out in the summer of 88 um, yeah. ish. Sounds and I turned in the f- first script to the second um, series turned in on January 3rd, 1989. So uh, it was pretty quick. Um, obviously, I knew where I was going with the first series, but I think it was taking Mark time to draw it. And we wanted to give Danny Bouvet plenty of time to do his work. So I was going to get ahead. And I remember sort of bouncing back and forth between finishing one and starting the new one, which was interesting. And yeah. But uh, pretty quick. I mean, once the first books came out, I, I do remember they did uh, multiple editions. Three at uh, least. Yeah. I mean, I think the first issue had at least five, which all had different frontispieces, which was cool. Mark would draw these new... Um, Aliens for those pieces that would mark each edition. So that was fun. He didn't, we didn't get enough editions. He was going to draw me into one and I, I didn't get in one, but. Um, oh yeah. With the, uh, the front cover, the front flap artwork yeah. he did of all the yeah. dark horse people. Yeah. So, I'm sure you've uh, probably seen it recently, Mark. Uh, Den Bouvier has been doing a lot of uh, alien and predator stuff recently. It's been cool to see him kind of return to that. No, I haven't. What, what's he, is he doing it for dark horse? I think it's a lot of just personal projects, yeah. isn't it, Aaron? Like yeah, it's, big, it's big been, paintings and stuff. He's been doing uh, a lot of commissions lately um, on on Facebook. Um, I'll have to send you a link to his his page actually, um, hmm. because he's just been smashing it for the last two years or so, just doing commissions and and throwing them up there on social media. Um, he's going to start great. start doing uh, prints and stuff. And and issue one came out July eighty eight was when um, the first one. Okay. So I'm pretty sure really quickly we, we decided, uh, also creatively, we, there was a lot of places still to go. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't like we had totally closed off the series at the end of the first series. Oh, no, I no. think now that I knew we were going to do a second book, I may have amended a little bit of the, the ending of, if I didn't think we were doing any more, that probably would have been a bleaker ending to the first book. But um, to the first series, but since I knew we were going to do more, um, left it sl- somewhat open ended for some well, of the characters. <laughs> yes, yes. And um, one of the really interesting things about book two was on was how on the first reading, it really looked like Spears had succeeded in training the aliens. And one of the things I like doing for like these um, these interviews. And, and when I'm doing articles and stuff is I like to go and read the, you know, the letter columns in the back of the singles and get an idea for what sort of people were, were saying at the time. And, mm-hmm. and one, one guy even mentioned having read issue two, I think it was a, a book two, you know, how blown away he was that Spears had, had trained and tamed the aliens. And obviously that's not the way it works out in the end. But was was there ever any temptation to make that you know make him genuinely succeed? Um, no, no, <laughs> no, no. I think he was always fated for his miserable end. Um, no, I you know, it's funny you know. Uh, I've thought a lot about who the aliens are over the you know back then, especially what what their whole story is. And I used to say this, now I think this is oversimplistic. I used to say, essentially, the alien is like a dog, but really vicious and really cunning. Now, that's evolved over time into that they have, you know, they had certain psychic abilities and they could fill your head with dreams and things like that. But um, at the time, it's like everything that's evil is us. Aliens aren't evil. They just exist. It's like, it's if, you know, a dog bites you, it's because it's hungry or something. It's not because it's you know, inherently evil. And I just don't think the alien in my mind back then was inherently evil. It wanted to survive and it would survive any way it could. And into its worldscape comes a bunch of biological mutton heads who shoot at it and mess up their environment and, you know, want to train it and do all this insane stuff with it. And it's just like, no, I just want to do my thing. I just want to exist and survive. So I never wanted to give them, you know, personalities per se, you know they weren't they weren't they were you know animals 
for lack of a better word. Now, that's just my take. Others can do other things with them, but that was my take. It was always the people that were uh, had motivations that were evil. Yeah. yeah. The humans are always the true bad guys. Yep. Yeah, that's a very common theme in the franchise in, in general, I think. Um, but when Earth War came around, uh, had it become apparent that Alien had legs and that led the story in kind of a different direction around trying to clean up the Earth for future stories? It, it did. And, and I think, you know, again, we didn't know how long this would go. Uh, and I, I, you have to think back at the time. For all we knew, Earth War, which I think they renamed Female War. Yeah, that's right. Um, it was could have been the last you know um obviously it wasn't but um so i don't know that we were looking at cleaning you know trying to prep the 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 territory for new stories uh but i did want to wrap up the trilogy to some extent i wanted to wrap up the stories of newton hicks um i will say that getting ripley in that late into the um brain pan of thinking about these stories i remember that being um difficult a little bit as a story to just figure out what that was, her relationship to nude at that point. Maybe I should have thought more about it before. But <laughs> I um, and just trying to work her into the story in, in an intrinsic way. And um, so that part made that one a little more complicated. And um, so, uh, but I don't think I was actively thinking about how do I, all I want to do is wrap up the trilogy. And I knew that story would be a trilogy and that would be the end of sort of that storyline and whoever did the next ones would kind of go off in new directions that I did know. Uh, and of course, that answers the question. But. There was that shot of um, Ripley with the, the big ass guns <laughs> at the, the end of uh, Nightmare Asylum. At that point, had you known that she was going to be brought back for the next story? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we. Yeah. The, I think I must have found out around the middle of working on the second series, and then then we built to that final image of yeah. uh, you know bringing her back. Definitely and a good also, cliffhanger with that. We also <laughs> knew we'd continue then too, because again, by the way, when I was working on the first one, we didn't know if there'd be more. Um, obviously, that changed pretty quickly, but you know some of these things. You know, okay, let's just put the kitchen sink in here because we don't know where how successful these were going to be. And I have to say, when we did the first one, we had no idea. Could have sold 2,000. We just didn't know. So um, happily sold better than that. So Earth War introduced the Queen Mother, a concept that would be revisited in the following series, Genocide, but never really again. Can you tell us about her conception? You know, I looked at that question. I actually don't remember. Um, no worries. Have, so... Uh, um, I think it was a, a, a my vague memory of it is, is an attempt to sort of up the ante a little bit is to do give one of the creatures more of a of an intelligence. Um, and um, but that's that's about all I got. I uh, that that one, a lot of other stuff was going on when I was working on that one. <laughs> that one's kind of in my memory has gotten hazier than some of the others. Earth War. Well, I'm, I'm hoping that means um, you might still be able to remember this next one for me because this is this is one that I sort of tripped up over on recently when we were talking about it on the boards. But I'd always been under the impression that the planet in Earth War that the Queen Mother lives on was a completely separate one to the the um, the home world in Book One. Was were they intended to be the same planet or were they intended to be different ones? Unfortunately, I don't remember that either. Um, so if it's not in the book, um, I, I just don't remember. I actually went back to the script to look and see if in the script it said, this is not the same planet, and I didn't see that either. So uh, I don't recall if we differentiated that on, pur on purpose or not. I, I uh, Sorry. That's fair enough. I can't, and, I can't claim any conclusive uh, decision on that one then. And out of all of the elements that you introduced in the comics that eventually became series staples in the films and later comics, which would you say you're most proud of? Well, I read that. You know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm curious what, what has become staples because I always oh, felt so how much, much time you got. <laughs> I, I always felt the books were very, um, you know, true to aliens and alien, the movies. It used a lot of the mythology that had been created in, in those series. 
So uh, if if they if concepts from my stuff had gone for it, great. I was just trying to think wh what was unique to those. And obviously there's story elements that are unique to those, but I was trying to think what, what's unique to those that have gone, has gone forward to uh, color any of the other stories. Um, that shows you how much I've read uh -huh. the other stories. Um, you got to list uh, them off here. <laughs> you, you introduced a queen face hugger as being noticeably different. Um, AVP, the comic straddlers would, I, di I didn't know if this would be an art thing with Nelson or whether it was something you would deliberately have, have noted in the script. But like um, in the comics, at least early on, you know, the, the queen hugger has spikes along it, like dorsal spikes. Mm -hmm. um, that would make it into the film, if not, you know, overtly um, obvious because of the mess that was that was Alien 3. Um, you got um, the military trying to control and train the aliens. Mm -hmm. You know that that would be resurrection, basically. Um, in as well as resurrection, the the aliens killing another alien. Yeah, that that uh, was what I was going to mention next. You know, he did that in in Nightmare Asylum book two at the start. Um, I feel smarter. Also, <laughs> also uh, from Nightmare Asylum, the aliens with the numbers on their heads that right. would make an appearance in the 2010 video game. Uh, aliens versus predator by rebellion uh, the player xenomorph character had the number six on its head so i would assume that was probably inspired by nightmare asylum as well yeah and um, um, you you introduced the praetorians as well the royal guards as well in earth war i think that was the mm -hmm. first time that um was ever done so you you there's a lot of different elements that you you did that have just you know, they were extensions of aliens that made sense that everybody else has, has gone on to use a lot. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, um, again, without having seen too many of the uh, books, you know, I, I, I haven't been keeping up that much. So, uh, look, if it inspired other things, great. I, I didn't get the impression that people that did Aliens 3 had really dealt with the books that much um I, I i could be wrong maybe they were maybe they loved them but i didn't get a sense that they wanted to do anything that took from those that they want to do their own unique experience uh, um but um i mean uh joss whedon wrote alien resurrection as i recall and uh -huh. i suspect he had read some of the comics um whether that colored that movie or not i don't know um and um um and then I, I'm fr I've, I've known Michael Green, who wrote um, the uh, Covenant, yeah. and uh, he worked on Smallville with me. It's possible he may have seen some of the books too, but uh, um, and I know Paul Anderson did because he. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, that's that's very flattering if they if those things did move forward. I um, that's all I can say about it. It's just very flattering. It's 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 great if they kind of stuck and became part of the mythology. That's. It's actually kind of exciting to hear. And aside from an earlier inclusion of Ripley, was there anything you wanted to explore in the comics that you hadn't been allowed to that comes to mind? No, I think, you know, I think we pretty much, I, I uh, was able to do everything that I wanted to do with the series. Um, uh, as we've discussed, the uh, introduction of the military trying to co-op alien and the, um, uh, if you went way back to the beginning, obviously it would have been interesting to have had Ripley from the beginning. That would have been an entirely different series. I don't even know what that would have been now. But um, if, if we'd had Ripley and the rights to use Bishop and some of the other characters, um, that just would have been a, an entirely different experience. I think sometimes you find that limitations like that actually help you creatively because you, the workarounds can be more interesting than what the sort of obvious sequel might have been. So the fact that we um, took sort of the situation we had and were able to you know, spin it into something that was interesting to us and, and fortunately to audiences was uh, ultimately turned out to be good for us. Um, and uh, again, the surprise of getting Ripley back um, complicated, didn't complicate, but made, made the last book um, it, it kind of spun around whatever thoughts I had going into it before we knew she, we had her. 
So, um, but uh, it was all good. I was glad we could get her because Ripley is such an intrinsic part of the mythology and of the universe. And I think Newt's story wouldn't really have been completed without an emotional sort of tete-a-tete with her. Um, anyway. Yeah, because she, I think she essentially, you know, she gets to do what Ripley did for her, you know, in, in book three, you know, she gets to go and rescue her little girl, her surrogate right. daughter. So, you know, it's a, a nice mirroring there. But just going back to something you, you just said, um, how would Earth Hive have looked without Ripley? What what was... Um, you know, I'm not sure... Sh- I, I, you know, those things become so intrinsically tied into... I'm not sure how far I'd gone into thinking about the third one until before I knew Ripley was coming back. So, uh, you know, without her, it just would have been a different story. And, and since I didn't have to explore it, I, I, I don't know what it would be. Um, I, the story we told, I thought, was, was good. So I'm not unhappy that we got her back. And, and, you know, look, to be able to write a story with Ripley in it is great. I mean, you know, um, it's like... Not many people I, can uh, say that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's bucket list stuff. I got to write Ripley, you know. Um, so, um, that part was great. It just, my, my memory of the time was just like, oh, okay, now what, how, do, how can I be true to this character, which who, by the way, was 14 years older and had gone through whatever hell she'd gone through. And, um, but the really interesting part of that was her, her relationship to Newt, who she clearly had abandoned. And so, um, how that colored their relationship. And looking back at your work on the series now, is there anything you would have done differently? Um, you know, that's interesting. Uh, you know, there's some... Conceptually, I, 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 I don't think so, per se. I think um, it's funny, as you write comics, I was still new to comics, pretty much, writing them when I did uh, the first series. And in, I, I sometimes think I over... You said, you know, it was very dense. It was very dense. Um, and uh, so sometimes I wish, this is going to sound a little strange, I'd opened it up a little more so Mark could do more of his amazing visuals. Um, but no, I, I, you know, that's going to, uh, when, when you see it finished, there's always things you kick yourself a little bit about. Why didn't I think of this? Why didn't I think of that? It's been so long, I frankly, you know, don't remember them and just sort of enjoy the experience of having done them. It was such a good experience that um, I don't look back and sort of like, oh, what could I have done or not done? They really let me do what I wanted to do. Uh, And Dark Horse did, too. They were very supportive all the way. Um, I've said it five times now, but that's just not common in um, my experience, unfortunately, or whatever. I've had great experiences other places, but... It, none like that. That was really like you guys go and have fun. It's sort of like put on a show, kids. It was it was great. Well, it's a good job you did as well. I mean, because would it be a stretch to say that if it wasn't for the success that your Alien series did, you know, Tynes wouldn't have been taken as seriously in the future? Well, I, I do think it helped a little bit, you know, in terms of... Um, you know, saying you could do interesting stories as a movie tie-in. Um, the, the other difference was a lot of the movie books before, obviously they're not true of all of them. Star Wars was a Marvel book. Indiana Jones was a Marvel book. Um, I don't, they never seemed to get the highest end sort of, well, that's going to sound terrible. <laughs> Sorry to everybody that worked on those books. Um, they never felt like, there was a, a strong editorial sort of, I don't know, brain behind those. They, they were interesting, you know. And then there also were a lot of books that were just adaptations of movies. So like Aliens adaptation, um, or I think the first Alien movie had a great adaptation. Yeah, to, but, to be fair, um, that was a fantastic one. Um, Walt Simonson. So, yeah, that's a great book. So there's a few really cool ones. But it, it felt like a lot of them were just sort of knockoffs. We're just, you know, we got the rights to see if we can do some stories about it. And I'm sure everybody worked on those as hard as they could. Um, we went into it, and, and, and this isn't to pat ourselves on the back, but it really was just went into it like, we love these stories. We can't wait to do them. This is going to be so exciting. Oh, boy. And so we really went into them with an enthusiasm to do a great job. 
and enthusiasm for the whole thing and no looking down on it. Like this is the thing we'll get past and then I'll work on my masterpiece, you know? Um, so if it, I think that, and then, you know, I was very lucky to do predator comics as well. Um, you know, they kind of said you can do these and have fun with them and they can be really fun comics. Um, which isn't, again, I, I always have to caveat that not to say other people weren't doing interesting movie comics. It's just, um, these were surprisingly successful at the time. And Earth War, you know, I always trip over the titles because yours, book one was renamed Earth Hive for the novels, and I always trip over Earth Hive and Earth War here. Um, so Earth War would be your last major run. You know, you did two shorts, um, Theory of Alien and Propagation, while you're working on one and then i don't know when you did lucky i don't know where lucky came into this yes nah. Jeez, i have to look back in the 90s but i i don't i don't recall i think it was after alien 3 um um i can't i can't remember i could find out but i can't remember well th those would be your you know your, your five alien stories but you had previously mentioned that you nearly worked on a fifth um a fourth limited run but it never happened because the story veered too close to what resurrection ultimately did and um, could you tell us a, uh, more about that potential series that well that's happened? what i was told um yeah i you know it was uh we had just started talking about concepts for that and i think i had started sort of like noodling together an outline on that uh an alien four for me anyway there'd been other books in between and um my memory was is we just got shut that that the idea just got shut down by fox um which was and my my th memory of it was something to do with alien resurrection and we were just close to that or we were in the same space as that um and uh um, it really just, you know, at that point it became, well, do we rejigger this? Do we try to find something else to do? And it, it sort of just, for me, it just sort of took my enthusiasm away at the time. And I just went, you know, um, if this is where we're at on this, I think someone else, you find someone great who can do this, that can work up the enthusiasm. I love the story, which I do not remember that much of now. And I've lost, lost my notes to various computer crashes over the years, but um, if, if, if this is how this is going to be, then I'm sure someone else will do a great job with whatever book you end up doing. Um, I have talked about doing some off and on with Dark Horse over the years. It just hasn't come together. I've gotten really busy doing other things. So, um, it doesn't mean I'd never do one again or anything like that. I, uh, it's, it's just, uh, I, I sort of told the stories I wanted to tell and, um, in those first three books, and um other people can carry that on and great and um i've gone on to do lots of other interesting things so um but i never say never to anything so when would that have been was that like 96 97 my memory was more like 94 it was because i think aliens resurrection must have been in development then and um it was it was in that era um so 93 94 probably and uh because it takes forever to make these things so um whatever reason we were just too close to something um alien resurrections on earth right I'm trying no to on, on, only the end um and that might have been it i can't remember nice. it might have been that they ended up on earth um oh yeah resurrection was written a lot earlier than i thought it was um first draft was end of 95 um they may have been discussing it earlier had had concepts that they were doing i could i could be wrong might have been 95 i just don't remember i still a lot earlier than i remember that surprised me there um now you spent this is another one of the things i really loved in yours um was you know you played with the space jockeys um in in your trilogy and you spent a good part of your trilogy working up a plot point where the space jockeys would ultimately use the aliens in, in an attempt to terraform the Earth. Um, but you, you never tied that up in Earth War yourself. You know, it was tied up in a short by John Arcudi, um, 
called The Alien, and John Arcudi go on to write quite a few for Dark Horse as well. So he did he did the fourth series, and then he did the re, relaunch in 2010. He did quite a few. Um, but in his, um, they snuck a, a nuke aboard the jockey ship and blew it all up. And that, that was the end of that entire notion. You know, it wasn't even tied up in Perry's novels of your series. As, you know, it just got dropped entirely from the third third novel. Um, were you you were aware of Dark Horse wrapping up that story like that? Did, did you talked about that at any point with them? Or was that all on them and Arcudi? Uh, no, that would have been after I left. So that would have been all on them. Um, yeah. Um, so I think I, this just sounds terrible. I think I knew a few years ago, you know, but, um, these things just fade with time. And, uh, but, uh, and frankly, I don't recall, I, my memory of the space jockey was it just that one shot of him we had. I love that shot of him in the first one. Uh, where they they Flirting see him and, yeah and you know uh, again it's funny having looked at the stills over and over again we really thought he was an elephant guy and not a pilot with a uh, helmet on with a hose <laughs> so um, I don't think you're alone in that yeah, yeah. <laughs> as did we all <laughs> I was surprised when they turned out to be large bald men um, but uh, anyway. Um, I don't, I, 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 uh, I'm glad they wrapped it up. I, I just, I, I, I I'm not, I, they don't consult with me on what they do as they go, go forward, um, which is fine. Um, and, uh, so every writer should do their own creative thing as they go forward and, um, have fun. If, if something from my story has generated another story, that's great. Um, now you've mentioned the extensive and impressive, sort of geekdom list of shows that you've worked on over the years, you know, TV shows. Um, now, having had that experience that you've had in the TV industry, and there's so many fans that we see talk about being interested in, in an alien series on something like FX or Netflix or something like that, you know, Hulu, whatever. Do you think aliens would work as a TV show? You know, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I might have said it'd be tricky i'd say now totally um because technology has gotten to a place where you can do the creatures and the effects and i assume it would be set in outer space but it wouldn't have to be um that you would need to make it as cool as the movies um and uh so yes i think it would make a great tv show um and um i would have to assume that someone's thought about that given the world we're in now. Um, well, we, we know of a pitch by Noah Hawley that uh, he was trying to get it made through FX, mm -hmm. um, and that kind of stalled. But it's, yeah, rumors have been swirling for, for quite a while, and I think, I think you're right. I think it's generally more accepted now that that could be a really cool concept. I mean, we have so many good sci-fi shows lately, like even, even Star Wars, The Mandalorian. Like, I, mm -hmm. I never thought before that that star wars would have been great for for tv format but that show comes out and it's awesome in, in my opinion and and uh, so many of those yeah yeah and um uh, shows like the expanse the, there's just what you can do now with uh effects i think makes makes different series a lot more accessible than they once were what about from a narrative standpoint though I mean, your trilogy is the closest Dark Horse and Aliens really came to any form of ongoing story for Alien, um, whereas the rest of it generally became, you know, limited series. As, you know, does Alien have the narrative strength to work as a TV show or would it work better as a season that told one story and then a season that kind of mini slash biggie anthology kind of thing? What what? what narrative would work best do you think well you know i think um if you did a fargo version of it um where um the one continuing character are the aliens um what's fun about that is or like american horror story what's fun about that format is um all the characters you you just you can be concerned about all the characters on most shows if you have a running character who's the lead you're pretty sure they're not going to be the ones that get eaten by the alien. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, just on a strictly, you know, plot point of view. One of the great things about uh, these limited series is um, you can really change it up. You can really do scary things. You can have a character come in who thinks the lead and, and lose them four episodes in, or they just leave and come back at the end. You can do all sorts of things in that format that it's more difficult if you're say doing a week to week battle aliens story which i don't think anyone would really that that's not a story i think you'd want to try to do you'd want to find that great human story about how the aliens are changing human relationships how they are affecting these people and then set them in the world of you know a tense world where they're having to deal with this and deal with each other um in different situations i think but yeah, I think a, an anthology type thing where it's 10 episodes or eight episodes and you do a whole new cast or you take a few of the cast, but not all of them. Um, that'd be, that'd be a really interesting way to go. Um, yeah, I think I there's, agree. It's, it's creatively as, as open as, as the mind can take it because from a strictly from a craft standpoint, you can do anything now on television with, with a few bucks. So um, you, you, that, that part would not be a big issue. You could do it on a budget even. Um, so it'd be crafting an interesting story to tell. Yeah, I think that would be an ideal format to just have, you have one season as its own self-contained story like American Horror Story. Another horror series that did that pretty well was, um, it's it's hasn't had its second season yet, but The um, the Haunting of Hill House, I think you just mm -hmm. watched that, Aaron. Yeah, I just but, watched that. Yeah, the the next season is its own self-contained story, and I think Alien lends itself to that more than like a long-running multiple-season arc. So yeah, I agree. I, I just think it creatively, it'd be it'd be um, you'd be just more uh, you know you invest in those characters not knowing what happened to them. True Detective is another good example of uh, a show that you just didn't know you you didn't have the same expectations you had with an ongoing television show in terms of what would happen with the characters. And I think that's a creatively, that's always fun to play with. Though you never actually wrote for aliens versus predator. You played such a huge part in kicking off the comic universes for both the alien and predator franchises separately that you had a character named after you in the first APP film, like you mentioned earlier, but um, kind of elaborate on that. How, how did that make you feel when you first saw that? <laughs> it was by the way, a total surprise. Um, I didn't know until the movie came out and, um, I'd never met Paul Anderson. So, um, great. <laughs> <laughs> it was flattering. Um, it was, as I mentioned earlier, fun to, to have someone with my name getting slaughtered. Uh, but, uh, I always uh, remember you and Bremer screaming. Biden! Biden! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think I got browned up in some escher machine you, of you got face stuff. hooked okay. you, i think you have the distinction of being the only character who was conscious when he was face hooked so um, you know not only do you get to set up these worlds you know your characters get um, unfortunate distinctions oh as no well. I, I think adele rousseau was as well wasn't no she? no no you don't see her face hooked you, you wake up on her bursting Oh, but that's the oh okay, I I see what you mean now. Well, it was flattering. It was very nice, <laughs> uh, and um, feel free to name anybody after me. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, Aaron. Aaron has a uh, a name in the Alien RPG that just came out, and one of the novels. I'm still hoping one day, great. one day I'll yeah. I'll be in one, but we'll see. I, I have a ship named after me in Tim Levin's trilogy. And I'm not sure whether this was a comment on fandom or whatever, but my ship was the one that was carrying all the aliens to a planet that was called Weaver's World, which I'm assuming is a tribute to Sigourney. So my ship gets to be the one that takes all the death to Sigourney's planet. And I was always <laughs> a bit, Tim, are you trying to say something here? Perfect. Um, <clears throat> now... As much as I'd love to go, what about this element? What about this element? And what about this element? This is actually the last question that we have from me and Adam. But before we sign off, you know, we did have a few questions that have been submitted by members of the fandom. You know, I always like to give them the opportunity to get things in that they've always wondered about. Sure. Now, Whiskey Brewer asks, of the original Dark Horse trilogy that you did, 
which do you feel came out better than you had thought going in? Well, I think all of them have their strengths, but I really, I think maybe it's just the blush of the new, but the first series, I think, um, to me, just because we didn't know what this would feel like coming together, um, just came out great. Um, it, uh, I think Bouvet's art on the second one elevated the the action elements of it, um, which isn't to say anything negative about it. Just he was able to give it this really kinetic um, uh, action feel. Um, Sam Key's art in the third one felt very uh, um, um, had almost an EC look, a Frazetta <laughs> at times look, which was interesting. A very different feel from the other other books. Um, but I think it's an artistic just uh, endeavor. To me, the first one in black and white with the original names is is uh, really, you know, works really well. That they're like talking about your children. Um, you know, <laughs> I I love them all. So uh, if I, you know, the second book, frankly, was more successful than the first one. So just on that score, there's that. But. Um, I think uh, just the the fact that everything was so new and the fact that everything came together on that first one was was awesome, but it came together on all of them. Uh, so uh, that's a kind of a non answer answer, but um, you know the first the first series was really just fun to see come together and feel like kind of kind of stuck the landing on that one, which doesn't always happen. Cool. How about you, Aaron? Do you have a personal favorite? The three. I can't pick between the first or the second. I mean, Bouvet is one of the gods of alien artwork uh, overall. But, you know, um, Nelson has so many gorgeous, gorgeous panels from book one that just deserve to be framed. Um, gun to my head, I think I'd probably go book one as well, just because of the sheer scope of everything that was done in it and all the elements it introduced. Um the other yeah. two were shorter as well. They yes. didn't have quite as much Four, room to spread out. Issues, yeah. yeah, I just uh, love Nightmare Asylum the most personally. I love the dark tone that that it has, and and the artwork and and the story as well. It's really great in that one. I mean, all three are good. I need to read all three again, but <clears throat> Nightmare Asylum was the one that really did it for me. Great, yeah, all worth buying. By the way, oh, definitely. Repeatedly. Pick, pick up. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I own. Uh, singles. There you go. <laughs> Anniversary hardbacks. Yeah, just show off your whole collection there. <laughs> the newer softbacks. And then Omnibus somewhere, some other singles somewhere, some other various bits. Yeah, just, just buy them all several times. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Christmas presents, birthday presents. Alien Day presents. Alien Day presents. There you go. And uh, another one of our community members, SM, would like to know, what point while working on the comics did you become aware of Alien 3's production? Um, I, you know, this is an unfortunate refrain. I don't recall. Um, I may have finished writing the uh, third series before I knew that they were making a third movie. Um, I certainly had no inkling of what they were going to do in the third movie while I was working on any of the books. So um, it may have been after I finished, but I, I did not get any pre, you know, no one sent me a script or anything before it came out. So I, I went to the theater having no idea what I'd see. And um, again, was kind of shocked when uh, the characters were killed at the beginning. Um, so um, I, I don't remember, I think I knew something was happening um, the only reason I think I may have known that is because I suspect Dark Horse had gone to them and said, maybe you should think about adapting one of the books. And um, that just wasn't in the cards. So. And Jamie War wanted us to ask about the decision regarding Newt and Butler's relationship. Uh, what prompted that particular story angle? Well, I was fascinated with the androids and, and with Bishop, and I just thought, Two things. One was, logically, it seemed to me that if you can build androids as sophisticated as, um, as uh, the Lance Hendricks, as Bishop, if you could build those, why aren't they the soldiers? 
because why are you sending human beings out there to be killed potentially if you can create artificial humans that can die and have their brains re-uploaded somewhere else or or whatever so first i started with that it just didn't make sense to send human beings out there if you could send synthetics um but then the idea came uh to extrapolate on that was to make these androids um real enough to a point that the crew could interact with them without being creeped out or or uh, and and to get the best performance out of them they actually gave them a certain amount of emotion and um that's what led to the love story between newt and uh and um butler um i i and and that was a very early idea was the idea that she falls for an android and then discovers toward the end that what he really is um and uh, the shock of that because it was obviously very horrific but then what i really enjoyed doing was suggesting she wanted to try to keep it together um that that it didn't matter that he was a synthetic android that she had fallen in love with him regardless and um, which was very bizarre because he was torn in half and uh, <laughs> it got very strange. But um, I like the idea that of, of an actual relationship that continued despite sort of, you know, borrowing the end of Bishop from aliens, um, what happened to Butler. It wasn't like, now stay away from me. It was like, no, you're still this entity that I was sort of falling for before. Um, so that's where that came from. Yeah, I thought it was one of the most intriguing narrative elements of both the first and, and second books. Um, and, and it does kind of play on that in the Alien prequel films as well, the whole do the, do the androids feel genuine emotion. And I also thought it was very interesting. Um, it's been a while since I've read them, but doesn't it suggest that the androids didn't even know they were androids, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah they kept so, them from them as well. So, yeah. um, so they wouldn't go insane, basically. Um, mm -hmm. That was the idea. And it was very much really the main character of the trilogy isn't she really mm -hmm. if you think yep. about it you know i like that i really do like i mean it, it's it's sort of subtly increases over the course of the entire run because it you know it starts with hicks really seeming to be the main player and then she's the one that gets the more attention and the more focus and throwing the more shit at to see how she reacts to it all yeah, I I always really liked how she was dealt with in, in, in the trilogy. Well, one of the great things about Alien and Aliens was how Ripley evolved into being the uh, main character in a stories that usually would have had male leads, you know. And so um, it's not, you know, that's that was certainly in my mind when we talked about Newt and Hicks, that I didn't want it to be the Hicks show with Newt as the girlfriend, you know. Um, that uh, I wanted Hicks to have the same sort, or Newt to have the same sort of um, power and agency that the military had um, while working through her demons. So um, that was that was a sort of conscious decision as well, which is why I really wanted Newt in the stories, um, to uh, both because it's fascinating to think how damaged she would have been emotionally after her experience, but but also because there weren't just an enormous number of female leads in quotes in these types of stories um uh, back then um, i remember taking meetings with uh, studios back in the 90s where you try to pitch a movie with a female lead action movie and it would be that they don't sell forget it never mind go away um that's kind of changed some now but oh, very, uh, very much so yeah. um, that was fun to do one that had uh, uh, someone that interesting at, at its center yeah it was interesting to see um Newt kind of taking the romantic initiative after that event in the second book, but Butler was very confused and hesitant to to continue that. So that was an interesting angle, and I, it was super sad that he got left behind at the end she, of the second. She book. leaves him to die in well, I suppose <laughs> cease to function. Bless him. Right. Um. So this is one we received a lot of variations on this question. Some diplomatically put some not so diplomatically put and that is you know book one book two um outbreak nightmare asylum whatever you want to call them they are undoubtedly some of the fandom's favorite series in terms of story and artwork now when it comes to earth war female war sam keith's artwork was not so universally loved as nelson's or bouvet's i mean even going back to the, the book's releases you know when i was saying about reading the columns 
it, it was it was brought up back then um how do you feel about that feedback surrounding the artwork of earth war you know looking back was keith the right person to be following up bouvet for this i'm not sure who could follow up denny bouvet <laughs> parents <laughs> uh, that that was i remember that sort of being a question um that was so strong uh that uh and, you know, look, Sam, um, who's a very nice guy and very talented, he was actually quite hot, too, at the time, um, doing, um, I think he was working for Marvel back then, off and on, or maybe it was after. Anyway, anyway, he'd done a lot of interesting work. Um, he just brought a totally different style. I think, you know, I, I respect that some don't care for it. Um, and um, I, I just, you know, in uh, it, it 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 was the best choice at the time, and uh, you know I hope Sam is still proud of what he did. I'm I'm proud of what he did on the book. Um, is it as successful as the other two? I don't know, and and I, so I'm not going to, you know, blindly say that, that everyone's wrong, but um, I think there's strengths in some of what he did. He draws a great alien, and um, uh. But maybe after Bouvet and after Mark Nelson, there was just it was hard to find. Think of anyone who could have stepped into that role and not been, um, you know, not had a little bit of pushback. So um, unless we'd gotten Denny to do another one or uh, brought back Mark Nelson. So um, it's a long way to say, I, I, you know, there's parts of it I like, you know, I, 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 I tend to take the blame myself. Maybe I didn't give him as, as good of a story either for whatever reason and um so um i don't want to just certainly i'm aware that the third one isn't as well loved as the other two and um however i think it, it has some strengths as well so i'll leave it there that's fair diplomatically put um now the last one that we have um which we haven't touched at all really um so far and this one's from david withers and he would like to know if you ever read any of the Perry adaptations um, of your of your comics, and if so, what did you think of them? No. Okay. <laughs> Simple answer. Um, no, and I didn't read the Predator ones either. So, um, which were by someone else. Um, no, Archer. I just yeah. yeah, I think that's great that that they did those. Um, and uh, it's funny. The only thing that's interesting is to read reviews of that comparing it to the book because sometimes it's like now i'm getting confused what, what was in which you know so, <laughs> uh, but that's just me um but uh, no i haven't i haven't read them uh um I, I was kind of stunned to tell you the truth that my comic book was being adapted into novels that was just at the, at the time i was kind of like they're doing what um. but great um and uh so you had nothing so, to do with perry while he was working on them or anything i don't recall ever meeting or talking to him so i think um again i i'm, I'm sort of not of a mind to like tell someone else what they should how they should write something um if they want to ask me i can give them my thoughts but uh you know take it do with it go with god um and um there you go but just off the back of that one then, because Perry and those novels are actually the first that sort of tried to rework the comic to exist in a post-Alien 3 continuity. You know, he was the one the first time that Wilkes showed up and Billy showed up. Um, how do you feel about that, you know, that retcon to bring them into line with Alien 3? Did he, do you think the story still work as well, being um, Wilkes and Billy? Um, I, you know, at the time, I re, uh, my my thought was, if there's a way to keep these in print, to, into some semblance of what they were, that's great, um, because I'm really proud of the work of them. And if, if, but, but the truth is, I think we've gotten to a point now where um, fans are sophisticated enough to know that this was a thing that spun off of the second film. The third film changed that. Um, just like there's 50 different versions of Batman over the years, I think there can be, you know, different versions of the alien canon that exist in their own little offshoot world, and, and you can accept them from what they are or not. But um, so uh, I wasn't 
let me put it this way. I wasn't thrilled with the idea of changing the names uh, because I thought the connection of Newt and um, Hicks to the original films was a big, was a really strong. Uh, on the other hand, um, I understand why they did it, but I had nothing to do with the editorial process in, in evolving them. Um, and um, I just stayed away from that. So I, um, again, was happy that they were still in print in some form, and I, that kept them alive. But I'm glad that the originals are back. Yeah. Cool. And that is actually everything from us. Is there anything you'd like to say, any anecdotes or thoughts that we just haven't given you the opportunity to with our questions? Um, no, I can't think of anything offhand. I, uh, um, no, I'm just glad people are still talking. I will say I'm amazed. Um, I think I started working on these in 1987 uh, that um, they're still in print and still, you know, that's kind of insane. <laughs> Good insane, but kind of insane. And that we're still talking about them. It's, it's nice. I appreciate your, your interest in them uh, and everyone's interest that, that's bought them and read them. So um, that's about it. I, you know, happy I did them. Glad, glad people still like them. Well, thank you again for joining us. And we do definitely still like them. And we we read them as much as we can. Yeah. It's, it's like I was saying to you, you know, Mark, when you said, damn, I'm going to have to go back and reread these. You know, any excuse to go back, at least from my perspective, you know, I still enjoy them after all this time. And I don't think I've even mentioned to you yet, but I actually met you about four years ago in um, in London when you came over here for the big alien one oh. and uh let's bring it oh you gotta sign one nice on my scroll uh, okay and also on uh, oh your signature poster yeah you signed it comic guy 2016 <laughs> Oh, was that at the? Uh, that was at that show in um, London. Yeah, yeah. It's the only time I've been to London, by the way. So, cool. I'm glad well, if, I saw you, you. if you ever make it out to Salt Lake Fan X, which is pretty much our our Comic Con, I'll have to bring my books. It'll be fun. Awesome. Cool. Well, Mark, is there anywhere that you'd like to sign post people to online to find out more about yourself and um, social media or, or websites or anything like that? I'm, I'm, I'm not huge in social media, but I'm on Twitter. So if anybody wants to, it's under my name, um, at Mark Verheiden. So if anybody wants to get in touch with me, I'm on Twitter and, uh, that's the best way. And, um, I don't, I don't have a whole lot of other social media stuff. So I just, I work under the radar. <laughs> any, any new projects for people to look out for? Um, uh, you know, I'm about three days away from hopefully announcing one. So, uh, which is <laughs> so a that, TV that, sh project. that and, should be out by the time this is out then. So, uh, I'll like, include any announcement links in the, uh, in the podcast post. By coincidence, it's a reboot of an eighties <laughs> franchise. So, mm. um, there you go. Uh, we'll see if it happens. Cool. Um, Adam, do you want to let people know our socials? Cause I hate doing this. Yeah. Um, if you, you can find us, uh, on our website, avpgalaxy.net. We're also on pretty much all the, the main social channels, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. If you search AVP galaxy or alien versus predator galaxy, you should find it. If you'd like to follow me personally, it's at ridgetop 21 for both Instagram and Twitter. And Aaron, yours is your handles. Uh, at underscore corporal Hicks. And that's Alien, Predator, Halo, Star Trek, Stargate, Airsoft, uh, basically all my nerdy interests. Um, and uh, if you are listening to this, um, we have started posting up uh, our podcast on our YouTube channel in uh, glorious video format. So uh, not only do you get these beautiful voices, but you get some gorgeous faces on your screen as well. So, uh, you know, pop on over to YouTube as well. Maybe give that a change. Um, but, yeah, okay, cool. Uh, this is Aaron Percival. And Adam Zeller. This is Mark Verheiden. I'm out of here. <laughs>